Thomas, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Do you have a favorite quote, something that inspires or motivates you that you can share with us? Sure. Uh, uh, almost like a mantra, I would say, is the uh, obstacle is the way. It's something I find myself, uh, fi I tell myself I'm growing frustrated working on something. And the flip side of that is kind of ask myself, is this a, is this problem something, uh, you know, me from a year ago would have liked to have or not? That's, that's a good way of thinking about it. It's similar to the, the, the concept that uh, I, I had uh, uh, Richard Fenton on who wrote a book called uh, Go For No. And uh, the whole idea being that if you're going on selling, look for the rejection, you know, kind of say, I'm going to go out and get like 10 no's because ultimately that's the path to closing that deal, right? Rather than trying to avoid rejection. Um, so similar, similar kind of idea, I think. So tell us about Cleary. What does the product do? Who's it for? And what's the main problem you're helping to solve? Uh, so Cleary is uh, an employee experience platform. So we provide a suite of software, you know, SaaS, obviously, uh, for uh, basically powering tomorrow's best places to work. Um, so we work with HR teams, internal comms teams, COOs, CEOs on uh, automating, you know, manual workflows for, for example, for people operations, and then creating this what we call it like this digital lob lobby or the central hub for employees, especially for distributed teams where everyone isn't in a physical space together all the time uh, to basically align on what is needed uh, and what they need from the company. So uh, one way of looking at it is a modern intranet, which has uh, been this whole uh, behemoth category of software that has been focused on IT for many, many years, but with a shift to especially distributed work. Uh, there's a, a whole new spin and meaning on what such a product can mean for a company. And so that's, uh, that's what we're about. Uh, it's spun out of uh, what I used to do internally on a team at Twitter. And where we're at so far, so we're about like 15, 16 people as a team. We've uh, just crossed a, a million dollars in ARR a few months back and growing. And we've uh, raised about seven and a half million in uh, venture funding to date. I want to talk about the positioning uh, and kind of where Cleary fits in, you know, the em employee experience platform is, is harder to explain because <laughs> it's, it's basically a, a you know, a, a new or a sort of unknown category for a lot of people and intranet is very well understood, but I think you do more than just what people might think of an intranet. So that's an interesting thing to, uh, to, to explore and, and what, what, what you've discovered from going through that and trying to navigate your way through the positioning. But let's start with like where the idea came from. So you mentioned, you know, hey, kind of was kind of born from what you were doing at Twitter. And so Ryan, your your co-founder was also at Twitter. Were you guys working together? Is that where the idea sort of kind of came from? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was, uh, so my background's mostly in product, product management and Ryan's is in engineering. So it's kind of a classic, I would call it founding um, kind of duo with its own classic problems uh, later on. But I got into Twitter the old fashioned way where I was interviewing for this role, which existed to create products for the employee base, uh, which I had several questions even during the interview process. Does this role really need to exist? What's going on? Why is there such a need that the company's investing millions of dollars in uh, you know, software for uh, their own employees? And Ryan's last company was acquired in and he was working on some things in HR tech and I convinced him to stay in the space by working with me on the tools that we had internally. And really the idea of Cleary is just a continuation of what we were doing internally at Twitter. And what we noticed that big companies, big tech companies with a lot of engineering, raw talent and horsepower will often find themselves building these internal tools focused on the employee experience. And we figured that is something that in the very beginning, we could, you know, just focus on those companies that just before they're about to invest in such a tool or such a team and do that in a, uh, with a services model initially. And then with COVID and a lot of the shifts more dramatically in the way work happens, we just notice those problem statements come way downstream into a company's like almost infancy in terms of how you solve these communication, alignment, productivity and cultural problems. So I always like to ask founders like how they got their first 10 customers and your story is very interesting because you got your first customer and then it took two years to get your second customer and 
you know, there, there's kind of a interesting uh, story there. But tell me, like, okay, so you guys kind of came up with this idea. What did you do next? Like, was it like, okay, we're going to start building it. We're going to start going out and talking to potential customers. What did you guys do? So the the surface area that we were working on within Twitter, uh, this is before we started Cleary, was quite large, right? So we'd have all these different various stakeholders from the the, the recruiting team or the IT team or uh, many other like VPs and different kind of groups. And we'd basically go around solving problems, right? And then before we even got started with Cleary, we actually got curious, like, wait, so what do other companies do here, <laughs> right? And uh, there was a period where we were just... Um, demoing like with whoever whoever friends that we had it whether it was like amazon or google or microsoft and like the ubers and the dropbox is like what do you guys have and then we kept seeing a similar set of tools emerging in all of these different companies solving similar types of problems let's call it with 80 percent overlap with their own, their own wrapping their own culture and you know a set of processes on top of it and that was really what got us the spark when we realized that not only is this problem appearing over and over again, it seems to have a similar-ish solution space, but then it's pretty dramatically different from the kinds of tools that are available from SaaS vendors out there in the market. So we put those two things uh, together, and uh, I would call us, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are uh, maybe not the the most risk forward. Our first customer was was Square. Like so we were talking about the first ten customers, and the first one uh, was was Square. Was really just through our network because they were back then much smaller than Twitter, and uh, growing uh, massively, and were looking to invest in a similar kind of space. And we said, well, we want to build a whole company uh, in this space, and so that led to this very unique collaboration. Uh, where we were basically service providers working directly and innovating with the team at Square and building this whole product that is central to the way now it's block any company kind of any employee comes into the company and experiences it. Um, and there was a series of, of lessons there in that first phase of the company about, hey, what we're doing is an internal tool. Can we do that externally uh, for sample size N equals one for a company that is similar size, similar culture, a lot of similarities. And um it just you know took us two years to do that. So, what was the decision making process at Square? How many people? Well, how big was the company at the time, and and how many people had to be involved in that decision before they would uh, agree to to doing this with you? Uh, they were well on their way to two thousand employees. I would say it is like twenty seventeen. Uh, late, we had there were like three different budgets, and you know like multiple VPs engaged in just like making this decision as well. So, I would classified even there it, it was a you know already in a, a truly enterprise sale and what did you charge them so that was very unique uh, so it, it wasn't a SaaS um, sort of arrangement we were uh, basically uh, saying like well we have a lot of expertise here we can build something great and something innovative that can really help for employees at, at square and everyone believed that it's like however, you are not an entity that really exists today. And why would we sign up for a contract on like a renewing basis until we like we get there? And so we uh, did a very uh, unique deal to kind of kick the company off, right? Where we were basically service providers, but retaining the IP. And the whole point was that it was really important for us to ensure that they're successful and we're figuring out what it takes for us to make them successful. And so that was this very unique exchange of value very hard to pull off generally, I would say. I think this would be something for folks who have domain expertise in something like very specific um, where you're able to, you know, like make that claim. But that, that was the way we charged them initially, right? So it was um, as if we were a product and engineering uh, consultancy coming in and, you know, scoping work, charging by the hour and uh, figuring out outcomes and, you know, SaaS and all that like uh, later on. Did you guys raise any money in those first two years while you were working with Square as your only customer? Uh, we did not. Uh, we uh, considered, you know, of course, the accelerators, like, you know, pre-seed and, and all that. But we thought there's nothing like customer revenue to tell you, like, uh, where things are going. So um, we really got started with a company with this pretty decent sized contract right off the bat. 
and uh, we figured we can keep that going. And as long as we're like learning with our with our goals and that initial milestone of making them successful. Obviously, this worked out because after the two years, you were able to then go out and and sign up other customers and and turn this into a product business. And some people listening to this might be thinking, well, that sounds like a great situation. You know, a, a big name like Square. They're basically paying you or to build this product. You're retaining the IT. Uh, sorry, you're retaining the IP. Sounds like a great situation. But there are also a bunch of downsides that come along when you are operating as a service provider, right? In many ways, the relationship is very different. It's not like they make a feature request and you say, well, consider it. It's like, no, no, we're paying you for this. So why wouldn't you be building this? That's one of those things that can happen. Another thing can be that you end up building a custom solution just for Square that is useless for everybody else, right? So tell, tell us about some of the, the challenges that, that you experienced in those two years that maybe in hindsight, when you look back, you would have tried to handle differently. Yeah, absolutely. And the initial uh, thinking was it was three months. <laughs> and it didn't go from three months to two years in one jump, right? Um, it was always evolving with like new use cases, new things that we want to develop and like push out. But that was the initial push. Uh, yes, there, there are many trade-offs, uh, of course. The, the, our thinking was we uh, wanted to ensure that um, they are successful. And then we trusted that everything else would fall in place, right? So we just we literally did not focus on you know, prosaic things like uh, thinking about the market, sales development, how you would like figure out how you might grow after this. Uh, And of course, you also mentioned the product risk, right? When you're uh, potentially over-optimizing. So we really focused in on getting them successful and then kept going from one to to the next. And then when you're moving from, uh, to or just spinning up a enterprise SaaS product, there's just infrastructure and a lot of things that we just deferred right? I think, I don't even know if you would call that technical debt. That's just literally the the initial infrastructure, right? That how would you like really get started that had to be built later. So we got to shift some problems later on, but of course we had to uh, pay the piper, right? Pay the debt off at some point. It actually took us uh, having to say no uh, to really find the resources to be able to focus in on our strategy. So once we felt we had learned enough, we got them successful, and we were uh, rolling forward. It was clear that we needed to build a SaaS version of this product and get that really ready to go more broadly to market. Um, Given number one, that we were bootstrapped, and number two, that we had so much demand coming just from this like one customer, we ultimately had to just, you know, uh, make a, a yes, no decision. Uh, whereas it would have been ideal in some world where if you continue with the thinking, let's, you know, keep having the services revenue and then we can go off and have this new division of the company that's starting to build off like the SaaS while we build up that, but that revenue. But again, we again try to have maniacal focus and say, well, we're at this stage as a company. Now what we need, we've proven this out. We've seen the, uh, we see that Square is successful. This is just the, the central hub. This is how every employee is getting onboarded and understanding what it means to be an employee at the company. You know, this is where their their content is flowing from the internal comms team. This is how I'm getting information about who is who and the org chart and profile. All of this stuff has been proven out. We really need to do it now for multiple companies, right? And so from a product perspective, that meant saying, let's now actually think about a whole new code base infrastructure. And we need to start thinking about an actual go-to-market motion. And I mean, we had a the crappiest one page. Uh, I refused to do anything but um, a one page website before we, when we first got started. So there's a whole a part of the uh, company that really started to come alive only once we made that decision. Okay, so you basically forked the code base and you said we're going to build the product separately to what we've done for Square so far. How much did that impact uh, priorities and, and your ability to keep meeting the needs of Square while you're building this new product. I know you said we had to say no to Square, but what, what did that mean? Give, give us an example. We were, like I mentioned before, we went we didn't go from three months to two years in, in one jump. We were always uh, you know, focusing our efforts on the outcomes that we are trying to establish for, for them in the next particular contract. So 
uh, we always made sure we delivered and always over delivered on like anything that we were like working on on them with. But then we had a very great, transparent and trusting relationship, obviously built up over time because, you know, we, we kept delivering for them. So uh, we were very clear with our intentions of what we wanted to do. So we're telegraphing that from day one. But then uh, when we got to a particular like renewal, we said, hey, this is going to be the last one. And then we're going to like move on. Right. So because of that communication, it was uh, it was pretty easy from the client's uh, perspective and they were well suited, to, ready to continue um, getting value from the product. Okay. And then, so did you start charging them as a product or did you just say, we're not going to charge you anymore now? There's no services kind of arrangement. We're going to go and build this product and then we're going to come back to you. Yeah. So we, we've just uh, uh, have had the continued relationship. Uh, it's like a marketing relationship. They're helping us uh, get other customers. We And, and if you think about our, uh, our eventual go-to-market process, a lot of our customers have been through referrals as people see what we've done and what we're able to do. For customers, so that's been a big part of the relationship. After that, so how long did it take to go from well, customer one, two thousand seventeen, two thousand nineteen? Those two years were Square, and then in two thousand nineteen, how long did it take to get to customer number ten? I think it was uh, in the end of twenty eighteen. I started like lifting my head beyond uh, Square, where we felt like we can actually get to some let's talk to the market more broadly and you know, we, we need to move on from being a services company. Let's build this like uh, a true SaaS that's actually available for many other customers. Um, so in early 2019, we ended up closing a couple of customers pretty quickly through the referral network. And then one thing at that point that became clear is, hey, it, the kind of investments that we needed to make to make a multi-tenant SaaS solution that scales for the enterprise while building a, a sales motion, right? That uh, is leading to a truly valuable SaaS product is a, we we needed to raise some funds, right? Because the bootstrapping approach was just not, we, we're just not able to make everything happen at the same time. So once we made that decision to say, hey, we need to now invest in the SaaS focus area, I went into both fundraising as well as closing the first few customers. So that's when in 2019, we raised a small round, uh, a few million, which got us the ability to you know, start hiring out a broader engineering team. That's really like what we like focus our efforts on. Um, from there, because we're dealing with, you know, more like, more like enterprise sales cycles, multi-stakeholder environment uh, in terms of the sales process, it was a good year, uh, year and a half, I would say, uh, for us to get to these, like, I would say those like first 10 customers. So that takes us into... The pandemic. Yeah. Great. And then everything went really well from then. <laughs> right. Tell, tell me what the sales process was like. I mean, being able to go out and say, yeah, we've built this product and we've got Square as a customer, that's got to count for a lot in terms of have, you know walking into the door with some credibility and, and some proof. But what kind of challenges were you having to deal with when it came to selling? I'm talking specifically about like, were people getting this thing? How were you pitching it? Were you saying employee experience platform then? What was the response like? Were people like, God, we need this, we'll be waiting for this? Or or it kind of took time to to get these people to kind of, you know, close the deal? Yeah, it depends on who you're speaking to, which is obviously a sign of like product market fit, right? In terms of what segment, what persona, and exactly like what we were pitching. So the first lesson there is like having a, a brand name logo and great like customer references saying this thing just works for us just is not close to enough it might get you in the door but it's not close to enough in terms of you know making a, making a sale i think any uh buyer anytime but certainly when times are tight uh is considering what is the value proposition for me and my business at this time we over index i would say ba back in those days on don't you want to be like this company look how great things are and it's like, well, we're nothing like that company. That's great. Uh, but we're different in all these different ways in terms of our, our processes and the way, the, the way we work and what we actually value at this time. And so that's where we really started learning a lot more in depth, the breakdown of like user personas in this complex sale. Uh, in, in, this, in this process, in terms of going from like one to 10, uh, I found myself in, uh, with a, a unicorn company in their, in their room doing a late stage demo 
And I thought it's a really important one. So we want to bring the whole company in. So all three of us, we want to come in there. We show up to this room. It's, one, it's the biggest one they've got on their uh, corporate office floor. And I was shocked to see 20 people in the room uh, on the customer side. Uh, you know, we've got folks like the CEO, the COO, the CMO, a lot of folks reporting into them, internal communications, IT, HR. And I thought, well, this is great. Clearly, we're onto something. Clearly, we're so important that it's worth all these folks' time to, to be on here. What I realized over time is actually all of these people represent, from a sales process perspective, they represent friction in terms of actually getting to the initial point of value. So the time to value is delayed even further. And these are the classic, let's call it issues or challenges with enterprise sales, right? So that was a true education for me. And I think earlier when I said, you know, Ryan and I are sort of a classic sort of founder combo product engineering is so what you end up, I think for most most startups, the riskiest part of the co company is the parts where the founders don't have experience, right? It'd be great to have a 10 person team and you've got a world-class designer and salesperson, marketing, ops, et cetera. But usually you see the gaps coming out based on the gaps in experience that the founding team has, right? And the more of it there is, the, the more of it, it reveals itself. Uh, for us, because we were working with one customer, we had a relationship, we were really going in depth on the product, we're solving those problems. We got to focus exclusively on our strengths for those years, right? So then after that, all these details, right, uh, were things that were an education in, in real time. And so um, there was this one stakeholder level question because we have a multi-stakeholder product uh, where we really need to identify depending on the company, who cares the most and how do we lock that in sooner and, you know, versus rather than later. Uh, so that was a big education for us in terms of the, whether it was resonating in the market or not. Uh, another piece uh, of it was really like size, right? Company size, there's a certain challenges like this uh, around communication, culture, alignment, uh, and productivity that really become a big issue at scale. So we were really negotiating and understanding what is the actual company size where the value really resonates for us. And it was a little bit like trial by error, but even though we had our hypotheses. And then a last piece around just sales process learning in that pathway from uh, one to 10, I guess I would say is that every company is a, is a little bit different. And when you're trying to sell you know, an enterprise wide value proposition, it is really helpful to, uh, understand their uh, worldview. And that's where we got to this lesson of really what we're doing is resegmenting, rethinking an existing market versus trying to create something brand new. So there was an evolution there for us as well, which is, you know, I, I used to use a lot of fancy words, but now I just say, hey, yeah, do you have an internet? Yes, no, we can replace that. This is a better way. This is the way that modern companies do, use it, right? Do you have spreadsheets that you use for your onboarding process? Great we can help you like save time. So just simplifying that into language that individual stakeholders can really relate to um, versus the grand vision, which I still like hold on to. And that's what our marketing website is painted with. It's a very different game uh, in sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat with sales. Yeah, I, I think sales, you know, 101 is like, make sure that the decision makers are in the room when you're having that sales meeting, but maybe they pot that they don't clearly mention is make sure it's only the decision makers and not a whole bunch of other people. Because, you know, I've been in that kind of the other side in terms of that big company. And it, you're, it just having too many people creates, you said friction, but it's just, it, it, it just slows down the process so much because you've got people bringing in like some valid concerns and questions. You've got to educate a whole bunch of people who start asking questions, but they aren't really decision makers. So you don't really care at this point whether they get it or not. And it's all kind of, you know, mixed in into this kind of part of these people turning up. So I, th I think that that the, the big takeaway there is like, try to keep those meetings as like small as possible. Like the only people that really, need to be there. And obviously that's really hard to do, right? You can't decide who the attendees are going to be and, and tell them, you know, only these people are going to turn up. But um, 
Yeah, I'd say generally if you if you're walking into a room and there's like 20, 30 people, that's probably not a good sign <laughs> that you're gonna close a deal very soon. Yeah, well, I would say with my sales experience now, actually, you can control that. You should know exactly who will be there. And any meeting, it's a sales meeting with you know 10 or 20 people in there, you need to have a certain number of meetings, pre pre-meetings with individual folks. If you don't, it's a recipe for failure, right? So it's uh, it can be kind of like rubber stamp meetings. It could be an awareness for just think about influencers or like pe- people who need to be made aware of the of the deal at a larger company that might be appropriate. But you want to be going into those because the key stakeholders are already like so bought in, and in fact they are speaking as much as you are uh, in the conversation. Yeah, that that is gold, and that shows that you have now earned the stripes in terms of going out there and and learning, uh, you know, sales the hard way. But typically, yeah, it, it is that, right? And you just said is like, figure out who those decision makers are. And if you're able to have one-to-ones with them or kind of a much smaller meeting, and then when you turn up to this big thing and they are being your advocate, they're already sold in. That's a very different dynamics to the meeting than just, you know, people turning up thinking, are we, are we doing this thing or not? Right. And just, so yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Let, let's talk about the, the positioning. So in the early days when you were going out, were you, were you guys already positioning this as an employee experience platform? Uh, no, we were your external internal tools team, completely different uh, sort of positioning. So the idea was that unlike what uh, Twitter and like what's going on for like for Square, right, where they can afford a whole engineering team that can really focus on their uh, people experience problems, we can... Uh, do that externally at a fraction of the cost. What well, was the uh, the initial like thinking? Now that really only applies, and the total market of that is like extremely tiny. It's the is the is the companies that at any given point are at the cusp of investing in such a team, uh, which we have you know gotten customers like in that in that realm. But that is just not the point of entry um, that really massively scales. Uh, we've evolved to really understand that who is the key stakeholder, right? That has uh, skin in the game in getting to the outcomes that we enable. And especially in terms of the timeline, we were talking about how we got to the pandemic with the company, um, especially with this dramatic acceleration of distributed and remote work. There became this whole new set of problems that were pretty obvious to a lot of companies now around how they need to have a digital hub for the company if they don't have a physical hub, even if it's temporary, in a way that helps unite their, their company. And as that was evolving, we found that the, you know, the head of people, the chief people officer, tends to be the person who is most impacted by the outcomes that we are able to enable there, which is to, they need to recruit and engage and retain a great team. And the retain and engage part is really what we're all about and what we're like focused on. So we really focus in in a more in a la- more laser focus in on that persona, and that helped us with our uh, just our messaging. But then on top of that, we added in this layer, and this goes to any kind of enterprise SaaS where you see a distinction between the buyer and the outcomes they're looking for versus the user. And in this case, the the buyer is the uh, the head of people or HR, and we're telling them how great we are going to make things for their, the average employee by having this product. But then we sprinkled in a layer of really their own departmental pain point, um, which was around the backend work, for example, for dealing with onboard employee onboarding in a remote world. So that's a whole other layer to the product, which uh, we engaged with so that we have a platform, which is both something that the average employee, the customer of our customer is using all the time, and also our customer, the HR persona, is using in their sort of departmental workflows at the same time. And that additional value proposition uh, layer helps simplify, uh, simplify the, you know, the positioning for a lot of our customers there. So you are a distributed team, and you want to have a great experience for your employees. And 
we can help help that in all sorts of ways and modernize your approach as an organization with the way you do all hands, you celebrations, public recognitions, employee directories, company news, internal comms, and all that all that. But also we know that you are probably using spreadsheets or task lists today, spending X hours in onboarding and all these other workflows, and we can save that for you and let us at least show that uh, for you as a starting point. And that second piece to it uh, helped us uh, accelerate the um, just traction in the marketplace. So you, you mentioned earlier that when you when you talk to potential customers, you'll, you'll say to them, hey, do you have an internet? This is kind of like that plus you know, these other things. So why not just put that on your website? What's the downside of putting your, yourself in a, in the intranet kind of bucket? Cause I, I think this is an interesting conversation in terms of figuring out what the right category is. Do you, do you try to kind of rework an existing one? Do you define a new category? And it sounds like you guys are still, you know, figuring that out. And you, you obviously you've had, you know, success and you've been, able to you know get to seven figures so far but um yeah where, where's where's your your head at and is it easier just to tell people it's an intranet it is arguably easier but we do think about the long term and that we're trying to create a brand that represents the future of work and uh, a certain perspective around how you treat employees the way you treat your customers and you think about the employee experience the way you think about the customer experience so that is why from a brand perspective we are really focus on the employee experience because that is the story that we want from a sales perspective, for example, for our prospects to be thinking about, right? We're, we're talking to these folks at Clary because we want to retain and engage talent and think about it in this way. And we think it's important for us to win that mental battle about uh, what is the problem that we're really even trying to solve for here, right? And that is a key point of differentiation. And then it's sort of a below the fold concept of thinking about things in the in the old world, right? There's several other things like that, including consolidating tools, saving money, and replacing an internet is one of those other things. But the headline we want folks to take away when they're talking to us is about this new way of thinking about their employees as customers and how if you have a distributed workforce, if you want to engage and retain them to create a great workplace of the future, there are many things that you need to do. And investing in Clery can be one of them. Yeah, you you said the old way when you were describing that. And I think that sums it up in a nutshell that defining an employee experience platform and the vision that you guys have is important, obviously important to you. And you want to show your customers in the market, hey, we have this vision and and it's a lot more than just an intranet. But when you talk to customers one-on-one and if they're not getting it, mentioning that probably helps you to move on to the next part of the conversation more easily but it also brings a lot of baggage right because when i was researching for this interview and you know and i was like employee experience platform okay let's unpack that and then i read somewhere intranet and i was like okay i get that but then i was like do companies still use intranets right because it, it kind of has this kind of dated kind of association so Okay, I think I get that now. It's like, we have the vision. You you really are trying to create a new category. It's not really about working in an existing one. Yeah, so that's a, that's an, uh, almost a philosophical question, right? So it seems like from a, uh, from a branding standpoint, we are trying to uh, uh, get the market to look, look in this direction, but we do need to wink to the what you used to have to be able to make that connection, right? So yeah, I, I've mentally gone from, I think we're creating a new category to resegmenting an existing one, right? So yes, uh, so 100% of all for- of Fortune 1000 companies have an internet. You know, it's uh, it tends to be Microsoft SharePoint as the, um, the incumbent. Uh, they've actually themselves done trying to do a lot of like innovation in, in that area. Um, and then there's things like, you know, wikis and like a lot of point solutions um, that are in this broader complexity of the um, let's call it like productivity software that we're all like interfacing with and integrating with. And so it's a, it's an evolving space, but I do think it's resegmenting an existing category because, you know, we're literally replacing budget in some cases, right. For that, like with what we're doing, combining budget for an onboarding tool and, you know, a Q and a tool and an internet that they had into 
what they can use towards towards Clery. So those are just strong signals that it is a uh, resegmentation because it's uh, taking existing budget and pushing it in this uh, in this other direction. Although with remote work, there's new unlocks happening, right? There's there's more money that clearly needs to be spent that's gone from real estate and in office kombucha, let's call it, uh, to other ways to you know invest in creating an excellent uh, workplace of the future. So we'd got to the point in terms of growth, first ten customers, pandemic, most beyond square. Most of your new customers were coming through referrals and through your, your network. Uh, what else have you done to to grow the business and get to where you are today? So referrals has been, again, like number one. I'll just like underline how excellent that's been for us. And I think it might apply for a lot of founders who uh, are very focused on building a great product. Well, if you follow that all the way through and you have enough patience, that's how it helps leads to growth, right? Which is... It has to be so good that it sings, it, it's engaging, and the customers are you know, spreading the word for you a little bit. And that's been huge for us. Um, and uh, especially when the, the product is not transactional and you're trying to um, reset mindsets, right? For, you know, so when you have your buyers like speaking on your behalf. Uh, besides that, uh, we've also done what I would call is probably the extreme opposite of that. Uh, which is uh, cold outbound. Um, so that's something uh, in an attempt to talk to prospects that are similar to our current customers uh, in as engaging a way as possible. So it's interesting the way that can sometimes um, work because you can be on someone's radar um, for several quarters in a month. And then we had a, 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 a customer come our way, uh, which I actually forgot that we'd had a conversation uh, over a year ago once they were into the pandemic, the value proposition completely clicked and they wanted uh, to, to come in and be a customer um, as an example. But that's been a channel that's um, really worked for us. The real secret to making that, it's a combination of quality and quantity. So keeping the, the messaging and the, the value proposition extremely focused with high quality uh, but then there's a rhythm to making sure that you're reaching out to as many of those qualified customers as possible. So when when you do get somebody to raise their hand, or let's also talk about somebody coming to your website. So I know you know there's no self serve kind of experience today. You ask people to basically schedule a call. When somebody raises their hand, whether it's outbound or or, or inbound. What happens next? What does the, the sales process look like? So we are very much a sales-led growth uh, motion. Being a product guy myself, I can't believe how many uh, years it's been that I've been wanting to do PLG for our company. I think it can, it can completely work, but we're st- staying focused on our market and the, uh, the signals that we're, we're getting there. So our process would be, um, uh, if it's inbound or, or outbound, let's call it, we have gotten to the point where we're doing a discovery call, really trying to understand the customer. Um, that tends to be a big debate uh, in sales about discovery demo, one call versus two. We've gotten to the point where it's mostly split out for smaller companies. And if it's a very product oriented person, we might show the, the product more. But our strategy there has been to have much more on the marketing side as possible about just what we are trying to do um, compared to what we used to have which was the one page that says, hey, Square uses us. So uh, that's evolved. So it tends to be a discovery call where we're you know, sharing our perspective and learning a little bit about the particular problem statements that are top of mind for the, the persona uh, there. And then followed up with a demo uh, conversation where we actually have invested heavily there in terms of being able to generate a custom demo uh, with personalized assets for a particular company, because really what we're trying to do is be an extension of the company for their employees. So part of that is having a product that looks and feels like the company. You can't paint the walls at your non-existing HQ location, but you can paint clearly and make it, you know, really what it means for you from a branding perspective and do a lot of customizations in the product to really, based on the use cases we unearth, whether it's internal comms or you know, the directory or the kinds of programs on the HR side they're trying to enable uh, really showcase a cu- couple of key areas of the product. 
and uh, from there, we were you know, kind of going into a trial uh, period for the, the key departments that are uh, evaluating the product for us. Uh, whether that's you know one week or a few weeks, it, it really kind of depends on the number of stakeholders. And then uh, typically, how long does it take to close a deal? Uh, it varies based on segment. If we're talking enterprise, which has, for us is call it, you know, a thousand plus person companies, uh, it can be on the order of uh, three quarters, uh, honestly. Um, but for a lot of our bread and butter mid market companies, it's uh, you know anywhere from a few weeks to two months. So referrals have been the biggest driver for customer acquisition. Number two, outbound is something that you're doing more and more of now. In the early days, founders often spend a bunch of time and energy trying to figure out what channels are going to work and not having a lot of success. G give me an example of like one one channel that you tried or you struggle with or just didn't work? Actually, at the extreme early days, um, I tried some ads, actually, just good old, uh, good old fashioned Google ads, tried some like LinkedIn ads, like way, way back in the day. It didn't work for us. Uh, I mean, retroactively looking at it, it's uh, if you're, if your messaging isn't uh, extremely transactional, and your brand and messaging is pointing towards a something like a new direction, something like marketing ad spend needs to be part of, it needs to be patient capital with a return horizon that is uh, well into the months. And so it just didn't do anything real for us, right? Um, and another piece that uh, was a little bit later on in the journey, but uh, suffered a similar fate. I would say just most things in marketing, honestly, have not worked for us in the early days when we just didn't have much to do there. But it, we invested in uh, event sponsorship, Right, trying to have the a booth and uh, going to folks, uh, going to places where the, the customers were, and we didn't see any uh, relative return on investment versus reaching the same people through digital means, right? Like through the through through outbound. So that just totally uh, did not work for us. We'd done some events and community. It's another thing within the world of like marketing, which was great for us in terms of like starting to develop relationships, but it wasn't because of the nature of our sales cycle, it wasn't converting into like sales qualified leads with anywhere near like what we imagined it would. Um, and it's funny because now some of these very things that I mentioned are things that we're going back to. And I feel like, you know, much more confident that it will succeed because a lot of the other things have been tuned around the sales process itself and the, and the messaging and not to mention a lot of these things on the content, oh, sorry, on the marketing side, going forward, what's going to be different versus what we've done in the past is it's all going to be done in partnership with our customers, right? So we're going to be putting them forward uh, versus quote our voice um, for all these different uh, marketing efforts that we may do in the future. Great distinction. I think you know, there's the question of like in the early days, does this channel work for us? Yes or no. And then the other thing is, is like, is this the right timing? for this channel because maybe we haven't figured out a bunch of stuff that we really need, whether it's messaging or product or had enough conversations with customers to really be able to figure out how to make this channel work. Did you have some sort of process for going through and testing these channels? Were you running experiments and saying, let's, let's test this out for three months and then we'll move on to the next thing? Or was it more like just throwing spaghetti every day and, and trying to figure out if, if something's going to stick, stick on the wall? Yeah, I would say it's like kind of like right down the middle, honestly, uh, depending on the, the, the actual thing that we were trying. So like something like a bigger investment, like event sponsorship, it was you know very much like this is something we're going to try and see if it works or not for us. But something like, you know, trying spending a few hundred bucks on uh, Google ads in the early days was like, hey, we've got uh, Google ads credit. We're going to try some things uh, and see if it see if it sticks. Right. Uh, or if there's an idea for a particular message. Oh, let's let's try that. We can throw a few hundred bucks that way. If I were to do it again, um, it would be to see like see what is already succeeding, and then know that that you can double and triple and ten x on that channel. Um, so, for example, like with referrals, and we're still not there's probably even more that we can do. And part of our community strategy going forward will be related to referrals, but uh, to generate more of those referrals. But I guess instead of cha trying channel four, five, six, and seven, if you're starting to see any kind of success from like 
even one doesn't even have to be two or three. Like there's probably levels to optimizing that further to help you get from certainly one to 10, if not a hundred, right? Okay. Uh, we should wrap up, get onto the lightning round. Um, I've got seven quick fire questions for you. Just try to answer them as quickly as you can. Are you ready? Let's do it. What's the best piece of, or what's one of the best pieces of business advice you've received? Timing uh, is everything. So any piece of advice that you might get may be true for some business at some time, for some segment, for you know whatever the thing is. The real job that you have, especially as a founder, is really curating advice and understanding whether it makes sense for you. And that in itself is the, the key skill you might even argue over time is wisdom. What book would you recommend to our audience and why? There's something I'm, I'm actually reading right now. Is, uh, uh, I got an advice about it on, in a podcast it's called The Sabbath. It's uh, a book by a rabbi uh, who is talking about how you can uh, keep one day holy and away from work. And it was interesting because I heard about it. I'm obviously not Jewish in a very secular setting. And uh, the concept of holding a day uh, free of work and what that means for you to just organize your work in your day. It's been pretty interesting for me to like dig into and think about how I would optimize my weekends. Are you, are you doing that yourself? Like, do you have a day now that you don't do any work? I am working on that. I am ni- I, but I am 95% there. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. I, I've been aspiring to do this, this idea of a digital detox one day a week, no devices, no phone, nothing, but I'm failing miserably with that right now, but I will get there one day. That's part of the, the idea with this book, because, you know, obviously you can't touch, uh, you know, anything with modern technology if the, with the, the old Jewish tradition as well. What's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful founder? Uh, willingness to uh, learn from experience and lived history. So entrepreneurs tend to be idea folks. You really think you want to see a change in the world, and that's why you might like go into it. But the folks who end up lasting and being successful, uh, bringing that other layer of humility and like learning and changing who they are based on their lived experience... Uh, trying to build a business. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Right, I'm not able to talk about Cleary here, but I will talk about a habit. So uh, one thing that's been super, I think it's super easy, works for me, is I spend two hours uh, in the beginning of the day focusing on focused on one thing. It might take me 10 minutes, it might make, take me the full two hours, but I know that I will accomplish that one and only one thing um, at the beginning of the day. It's helped me uh, just really bring maniacal focus to my day. And it's, it's been great. Uh, being able to do one thing seems not great, but if you know that you're doing one thing every single day and it's the most important thing, it really helps uh, set the tone. And then for me, I'm a morning person. I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast and stayed on East Coast time for about a decade. So feel like I get that head start. Great. Love it. Uh, what's a new or crazy business idea you'd love to pursue if you had the time? Uh, the other day I was in the park with uh, my uh, son and this uh, other parent had this giant bubble machine um, going and it just brought all the kids like moths to the fly uh, to the bubble machine. I was, we we're just like talking about our, so our parents like, you know, if I'm running, if I'm selling ice cream in a playground, I would have one of these giant things uh, going with it. And I almost want to see if uh, that could like uh, really work some innovation in the playground ice cream business. Uh, what's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? Uh, back in the 90s, I was the webmaster for Absolute Nintendo 64 in the world uh, pre-Google where um, people used to have links on their websites and it was called Absolute so that I could have be at, towards the top of various link lists. And it was like this wonderful world of reviewing and previewing uh, video games, which is my whole conduit into tech more broadly. Wow. And uh, finally, what's one of your most important passions outside of your work? Uh, lately, I've, uh, it's, it's, been, it's all shifted towards uh, being a dad. I have an almost two-month-old, going to be planning a birthday party soon. And it's been uh, a profound shift in the way I approach uh, life. Sundays, as an example, like we were talking about with, uh, with the book. And it's just a, a, a wonderful experience for me. 
Awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting and, and trying to unpack this story of where you and Ryan were back in 2017 to where you've taken the business so far and some of the lessons you've learned along the way. If people want to check out Cleary, they can go to go Cleary. That's clear with a Y dot com. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, on email, thomas at gocleary.com. Thanks, man. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I wish you and the team the best of success. Thank you.